ಯಾತಕ್ಕೆ ಹೇಳಿದ್ರೆ ನೀವು ನೋಡಿ ನಾನು ಸೆಲೆಕ್ಟ್ ಎಕ್ಸಿಸ್ಟಿಂಗ್ ಬ್ರಾಡ್ಕಾಸ್ಟ್ ಕೊಟ್ಟು ಹಾಂ ಹಂಗೆ ಕೊಡಿ ಕೊಟ್ಟರು ಅದು ಕೊಟ್ಟರು ಹಂಗಂತ ಅಂತದ್ದು Hello, good evening and welcome to uh, tonight's uh, live interaction. We have perhaps not had it in the past couple of weeks, I don't recall. But yes, it's better to do it after the end of a chapter. So now that we've finished the chapter on BioShields for disaster mitigation, uh, I'm looking forward to an interesting interaction tonight. Uh, how do we... yes the it it emerged after the asian tsunami in the learning process that uh, bio shields it could be coastal forests any kind of natural feature or a physical feature a geographical feature if you will uh, can make a difference if it is there and if it is intact in its natural state it can mitigate the impact of a natural calamity on the human landscape it could be uh, just sandbars or sand dunes uh, or it could be uh, mangrove or littoral forests it could be sandscape sandbars it could be even uh, coral reefs under sea so all these are capable of um, limiting the impact or decreasing the 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 impact the ferocious impact or the negative impact of a natural calamity on the human landscape say for example if there is a sandbar uh, it can help fisher folk villages uh, it can protect protect fisher folk villages from the 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 power of say a tsunami or coastal incursion anything in the day and age of climate change it is important that uh, the impact of Now, these kind of uh, whatever it is the, the impact of these kind of natural calamities be reduced at least on the human oh. landscape that is very very important and so that is why uh, it it is it is important to conserve uh, whatever kind of geographical features there are there was um, yeah the the fact that there was a lot of mangroves present in certain areas of the tamil nadu coast proved that they were um, shall we say proved uh, their efficacy in saving lives in certain villages wherever there were mangroves oh, of oh, is need to put on the mosquito which i did yeah so the 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 presence of mangroves in two villages in the vedaranyam district of tamil nadu showed that uh, the presence of mangroves mitigated the power of the tsunami waves inland in the vedaranyam district in fact it prevent, prevented the death of wildlife also only apart from two deer spotted deer that died in vedaranyam forest nothing else no other wildlife uh, were affected this was also the case in um, this was also the case ha huh? the mosquitoes can be killing you know this was also the case in sri lanka yala national park was effective in uh, preventing deaths around the south the extreme southeast of sri lanka i'll show you where on i'll show you where uh, in both in india and uh, in sri lanka i shall show you in india vedaranyam is this part nagapatnam district and this is these are the uh, mangrove forests of vedaranyam all right and in sri lanka this is where yalana this grab patch of green is where you find the yalana national park in fact elephants which have been collared
elephants which were collared in sri lanka have been seen or monitored having gone inland when once they sense that the tsunami waves have been released off indonesia so uh, that is uh, another part of animal behavior that's part of animal behavior but nevertheless uh, see here uh, i think i should show you this again this this is sri lanka and this is the this is the southeastern part of sri lanka this is yalan national park as you can see uh, this this area with a lot of sand dunes on the beach beaches rocks they prevented uh, damage to the inland to the uh, to fishery fishery zones to the reef ecosystem etc was protected from the tsunami waves so that's proven then again in um, in india in vedaranyam again i should show you as vedaranyam here is vedaranyam uh, these these forests only two deer spotted deer uh, animals died in this in the tsunami waves most of the others they were all the other wildlife were saved this became a big issue and anyway ts petai further up here in nagapatnam in kadalore and nagapatnam and all that kadalore district somewhere yes kadalore district pichavaram here i think this is pichavaram this is this is pichav yes this is pichavaram pichavaram the 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 mangroves shielded the fisher folk and the coastal population from the the terror of the tsunami waves whereas um, in uh, other area like ts petta where the mangroves had been decimated the people were the many people died the sandbar in kilai also i think this was kilai i'm not too sure akare petta kilai etc uh, they also suffered a lot in fact villages were just washed off so uh, this is the learning as far as bio shields are concerned it's very very effect effective Anyway, there is a question: What is bio shields for disaster mitigation? This is exactly what it is. Any kind of natural features that you have, it could be mangroves, it could be some kind of littoral forests, uh, coral reefs, sand dunes, beaches, uh, rocks. These are all physical. Some of the these are the bio shields, so to say, the natural edifices, uh, which help in mitigating the impact or the power of a natural calamity on the human landscape that's what bio shields are for disaster mitigation uh, this was repeatedly seen even in thailand and uh, in louisiana in america when uh, sorry, uh, hurricane katrina uh, damaged all the the coastal areas and after that after katrina there was another big huge hurricane which created havoc on the levees in uh, new orleans i don't remember that particular it was after katrina what is the role of a bio shield in disaster management exactly what i'm talking about it can it can uh, stimmy the or lessen the impact of the calamity on a human landscape if you have mangroves or littoral forests like in new orleans it's a very low lying area i'll tell you where new orleans is in the map uh, so india we have to go back to texas and new orleans in united states these areas see this these areas uh, the, the the delta areas of the mississippi uh, they were hammered by hurt uh, this is louisiana the levees these are all low lying coastal areas uh, i hope you can see this i don't know this is uh, southern united states at the gulf of mexico coast uh, and these areas this is louisiana these are very low lying areas and it's the delta region of um, it's the delta region of what is this yeah this is the area is the delta region of the mississippi river so uh, that though that area was pummeled by hurricane katrina and a lot of hurricanes happened there uh, that is when uh, these kind of uh, whatever natural features that are there coastal or mangrove forest littoral forest coastal features it could be just uh, it could be just uh, rocks and sand dunes beaches those kind of things uh, it's an ecosystem in itself and if those are protected 
uh, then naturally the human landscape can be protected from the power of uh, the the kind of you know hydrometeorological disasters it could be in it could be coastal incursion it could be coastal a cyclone it could be uh, sea level rise it could be so many things uh, then it uh, climate change brings a whole lot of uh, shall i say uh, disasters hydrometeorological disasters there are a lot of questions coming up how can protection of wildlife and mangrove ecosystem help mitigate natural calamities well it's not just protection of wildlife but there are certain things like there is endemic wildlife it could be the dugong for example the it's a sea or sea cow if you protect its habitat and if you protect it then it it's an interdependent symbiotic relationship you know if the dugong is there it will protect the ecosystem and the sea grass meadows under the sea so once you have the sea grass is protected then naturally the sea and the whole ecosystem are protected and once the ecosystem is protected then you will not the power of hydrometeorological disasters is uh, uh is brought down or shall we say uh, is um, reduced so that it's not directly the wildlife itself but the, the wildlife's role in in uh, shall i say sustaining the ecosystem in sundarbans for example in india it is the largest mangrove ecosystem in the whole world and sundarbans is the home to the coral reef as well as to the freshwater crocodile and the saltwater crocodile also the tiger and the leopard uh the it has a whole spectrum of wildlife so if you protect wildlife then they protect the ecosystem and when the ecosystem is protected obviously the power of uh, natural calamities and the impact of the powerful natural calamities on human landscape is mitigated how can mangrove shelter vulnerable coasts from cyclonic ecosystems cyclonic systems ha huh. uh, this is a very interesting question yes that's the power or point of this uh, uh, chapter so to say mangroves uh, are a very unique ecosystem is this mangroves are a very unique ecosystem and they have they have uh, the power to shall we say sequester carbon uh, they will uh, and it is an instance it's an intertidal ecosystem it can change the it or rather it controls and regulates the tides every 6 hours in doing so it can have a powerful impact in mitigating cyclonic storms we have seen cyclone isla did not have much of an impact or rather did not uh, it it did not have the power to kill people and maim lives etc uh when cyclone isla happened it's a very thickly populated landscape the sundarbans if you re realize so those kind of things and uh, sundarbans has helped even mitigate the power of the tsunami asian tsunami uh, then uh, it has in as far as cyclonic ecosystems yes it can uh, it can regulate the 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 waterfall or the yeah the the water or rainfall of a cyclonic cyclonic storm when it falls in a mangrove ecosystem somehow it regulates the inter, the aerial roots of the mangrove or the intertidal ecosystem of the mangroves in a coastal place it can regulate the cyclonic storm as we have seen so in doing so it can uh, protect the land from uh, the impact of a cyclonic storm what is a coastal bioshield coastal bioshield are all these geographical features it could be uh, littoral forests mangrove forests sand dunes uh, beaches uh, then it could be coral reefs shoal ecosystem and it could be even uh, sandbars uh, rocks then the submarine uh coral reefs are very important they are called the rainforest of the deep so all these are bio shields put together they are called as bio shields even the it's essentially landscape level conservation that's what is being uh, advocated here uh, so all these geographical bio geographical features are are clustered or nomenclature together as bio shields in the parlance of disaster mitigation this is the language that has come about after the asian tsunami it's a whole domain in itself a whole subject or a discipline in social sciences that has emerged after the asian tsunami so that's what it is uh, that's what a bio shield coastal bio shield is we have a lot of them you have even small small hills or fault lines that go into the uh, the sea i'll show you some of the fault lines that go into the sea it's very interesting 
in in Asia, I will show it to you. But it's all these, even this marine national park is Bermuda. This is also a bio shield, for example. Uh, this entire plate, so to say, is a very rich and very sensitive and fragile ecosystem. But let me show you more in Asia and Southeast Asia. Uh, all these island ecosystems with a lot of mangrove cover, they're all coastal bio shields. And you have, or see, you can see a lot of reef ecosystems here near Penang, all these, you know, very light blue colored seas. They're all the reef ecosystem. They're the extremely sensitive uh, uh, ecosystem. Here on the northeast coast of Sumatra, here you see a lot of this very light blue color here. And that is the delta region or the reef ecosystem. That is where the rivers pour out into the sea and they bring a lot of silt. So there's perhaps a lot of alluvial soil. It's all a lot of sea grasses maintained here. So that's why it is bluer, light blue in color. That's a shallow sea. You get it? And, and then I'll show you. Yeah, this mosquito thing is. So there are a lot of these kind of these island ecosystems on the west coast of Sumatra, for example, uh, on the, let me show it. All these, the Indonesia is very, very, it, in fact, it is governed by the maritime law. Then all these places, you know, where there's a shallow sea, I show you a lot of places. There are a lot of such places in Sri Lanka, in Indonesia, in India. In India and in Sri Lanka, I'll tell you, there is, I think, uh, there is a particular hill. I've seen it in Tangala or Mirissa. In Miris, Mirissa. There are certain offshore uh, hills or whatever. See here, there I saw some rocky ecosystem, essentially. I saw some rocks and uh, offshore physical features. And I'll show you in Karwar in India as well, where the Western Ghats goes into the sea. It's an amazing place. You have these kind of uh, small, small islands. Oh, is the rock light? Oh. There is this Kurungad, I think. This is Kurungad. No? So either this one or... Uh, this must be Kurumgat. All these these small small islands you see here off the coast of India, off the coast of West India in the Arabian Sea. This is uh, these are what's called uh, shall we say bio shields. Uh, these all these small small islands. This is a hill. I have a whole very interesting story. My parents in 1971. This was apparently. Uh, I think the judicial magistrate's bungalow is somewhere here on this island and uh, my, my poor mother was all of 21 years old and she was just married and she uh, she went here to, I mean, my father took, my father and mother, they visited this judicial bungalow and my mother without knowing, she went to an abandoned toilet full of snakes. Uh, so she had quite an adventure there and came back in absolute panic you can imagine so that ha that is somewhere here it happened this is very difficult i have to do this every time somewhere in karwar somewhere off the mainland some one of these island i don't know which one but my parents had this had gone there and they had this a very uh, saucy and caustic adventure with the snakes. It may have been non-venomous snakes, but uh, a 21-year-old woman would not be very comfortable even visiting or going inside a toilet with uh, snakes in it, obviously. Yeah. So that was one anecdote, travel anecdote my, of my mother. Uh, in any case, so, so these are all bio shields. What I'm saying is these are all coastal ecosystems and uh, anything, all of, all of these biogeographical features are uh, bio shields, so to say. I hope that explains. Okay. 
let me go back. Oh, there's so many questions. How can biofilms protect livelihoods? Ah, that's very, very interesting. interesting. Biofilms can protect livelihoods because, for example, mangrove forests are nurseries for fish stocks. It could also be, um, uh, what do you say? Yeah, it's nursery for young ones of all kinds of marine creatures. Even crocodiles have their nests in uh, mangroves. I have seen a king cobra. Uh, in, in a, a mangrove forest in Peter Kanika, turtles, they have their, um, I think I should switch off this blessed WhatsApp for now. It can be a disturbance. Yeah. So, so, yeah. Mm. Yeah, the, it can be a nursery for turtles, uh, whales, coral reefs, uh, reef sharks. Uh, all kinds of marine creatures can uh, have their, uh, shall we say, spawning ground. They can lay their eggs here or their eggs can hatch. Uh, it can be a nursery for the young ones of many an endangered wildlife. It could be estuarine crocodile and they're very, at that stage, they're very, very vulnerable, you know. Uh, so these are all, uh, shall we say, uh, nurseries or spawning grounds for endangered wildlife so and when i was talking about uh, livelihoods i have to go back to that question how can bio shields help livelihood security when there are there it can be a bio shields like say a mangrove forest can be the ideal spawning ground for a variety of fish so that's where the livelihood security of fishers fishers will have a stake in conservation of bio shields because their uh, fish stock gets replenished in fact, uh, this has been a very successfully uh, documented project in Tamil Nadu. In Tamil Nadu's Pichavaram, which was uh, the theater for the security of the fisher folk, uh, there the MS Faminathan Research Foundation has undertaken livelihood training for fishers. The Irulas and tri Irulas are tribals who did not know fishing. They were hunter gatherers who were dependent on hunting snakes and eating rats. But the, after the Asian tsunami, they were included in the scheduled tribe list. And then uh, what happened was they were they were able to make use of all the legislative legislation and the benefits for them for any scheduled tribe in the Indian uh, legal system or in the Indian state. And they after that, they were given training in livelihood skills by the MS Swaminathan Research Foundation. They have been taught fishing, they've been taught crab trapping and um, aquaculture skills and so on. So now, I, under the guidance of the MS Swaminathan Research Foundation and the Coastal Ecosystems Research Division of the MS Swaminathan Research Foundation, they have been given this kind of training and they are now expert fishers. They have a secure and a secure livelihood. They lead a respectable life and life, life, lifestyle and livelihood but uh, yeah and this is the the successful experiment in the Pichavaram forest all right uh, then uh, what so that's how uh, it shows that mangroves can spawn fish diversity in the and I'll show you where Pichavaram is I think I just showed it to you. Nevertheless, Chidambaram. This must be Pichavaram. Yes, this is Pichavaram. So this is where uh, the 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 this mangroves today also they are spawning grounds for a variety of fish the fish diversity that takes birth or that sustains in a protected mangrove ecosystem like pichavaram or any of the coastal mangrove forests uh, there's also forest near chuti corn i'll show that in a bit uh, mangrove forests are there uh, it can be ideal breeding grounds for not just fish not just fish, but also for birds, swans, turtles, marine wildlife, marine cetaceans, and so on. Uh, reptile, marine reptiles, uh, 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 reptilian fauna. It could be turtles as well. So these are all things which uh, sustain and get protected there. So that's and that is why fishers find fishers have a stake in protecting uh, 
the mitigation uh, the bio mangrove bio uh, mangrove parks or mangrove ecosystems in fact it is a very interesting experiment uh, the irulas in tamil nadu were able to benefit from uh, the something called forest rights act the forest rights act had legally notified pichavaram forest as a protected forest division and fishing was not allowed but the ms swaminathan research foundation intervened very successfully and said uh, this is um, this is how if you can make the irulas beneficiaries or stakeholders they will protect the forest in return for uh, fishing rights so they are allowed fishing rights they didn't have food security remember they were hunter gatherers so the ms swaminathan research foundation advocated and lobbied for their rights fishing rights in the mangrove ecosystem in epichavaram and in return for their fishing rights which gave them food security they have to protect the forest so they go all out and protect not just protect the mangrove ecosystem by way of patrolling and aiding the forest department in protection it also prevents fire forest fire you know it stops forest fire so they have not just protected and aided the forest department and patrolling for the protection of the mangrove ecosystem but they have also taken extremely active uh, measures in planting mangrove uh, species diversity of mangrove species for um in a fish bone pattern so that it augments the intertidal ecosystem and it helps the spawning of fisheries etc so that's a very very interesting experiment both the biodiversity act and disaster management act food security not just both i mean disaster management act biodiversity act food, forest rights act livelihood as security act all of these came in into in a interplay in the theater so to say in the theater of disaster mitigation and the irulas have benefited in a win win solution so that uh, not just the ecosystem but also the tribals have benefited this is the it's a very interesting experiment a socio cultural and socio economic experiment and a sustainable solution at that i hope that explains i have written two articles which i will put up in the in the box of the live interaction or of the video i have written two articles one in interpress news service and one in 101 reporter both of them have been about this issue uh, it will be and i have also done a film uh, which i will put up uh, the link of that i also i'll put up uh, which will hopefully be of uh, interest to you and i hope i've answered you does bioshield management help food security exactly like they did in the case of the irulas they were hunter gatherers and they were only eating uh, rats and hunting snakes and once a, eating a snake once a week was not enough to fill their bellies so they were taught fishing and uh, and after that the not just were they taught fishing they were also given fishing rights in in lieu of protection of a mangrove ecosystem so now and they have also been included in the scheduled tribe list so they get food rations for free they get rice for free and with the fish catch they also have a livelihood security which they can sell and they keep a portion of the fish catch which they eat with their the rice given to them through the pds that is the public distribution system and today they have food security they have fish they have native nutrition they have fish catch they have uh, rice which is their staple diet so they're very happy they in fact they're asking us now in fact when i went there for my book research they said madam please make sure that we get higher education we have only high school education here in our fishing colony please make sure that we get higher institutional education higher education and we need to have more infrastructure educational infrastructure so you can see that there's a lot of development that has happened there <coughs> pardon me uh, what is the current national policy framework on bio shields yeah that is see we have um, legislation like uh, forest rights act and then we have uh, the disaster management act which um, has documented fairly effectively the efficacy and significance of mangroves and coastal littoral forests and bio shields uh, to a large extent sand mining is still the threat coastal beach sand mining is still the threat because that is and then you have paradeep port which is another unfortunate uh, shall we say um, scar on conservation the paradeep port or building any kind of unsustainable anthropogenic uh, 
activity can be a detrimental to conservation. So that is still a, a black mark, so to say. But otherwise, we have a lot of legislation in place and only what is found wanting is the lack of implementation, enforcement of the laws. Uh, we have a very corrupt administrations and very lethargic. So they don't particularly uh, go all out to protect the forest. So if you do, if that is there, then oh, there's, India has the laws, India has the social fabric. But a lot, after the Asian tsunami, a lot of importance has been given to research and conservation of mangroves and bio shields. Uh, nevertheless, uh, there are certain gray areas that you have uh, in the leg legislation in place, you have implementation to some extent, then you have certain win-win solutions like even the NGOs are participating. So all that is there. And But then uh, some black areas like illegal sand mining on the beaches are still continuing. It's called, so it's a matter of enforcement. There is also, the, like I said, partnerships with NGOs, interventions with you know the marginalized people like maybe the Irulas or the Monken, Monken tribe in, Tha in Thailand, they got integrated after the Asian tsunami. Uh, they have become part of the state, statecraft. They have become, they were disenfranchised, isolated, alienated, uh, deprived, so to say. It depends on which point of view you take. But they were not part of the state, the Monken tribe. After the Asian tsunami, given the fact that they suffered uh, which is again a polemical take. We don't know how much they've suffered. There are, there are people who say this, they say they have not suffered, then they say some of them have suffered. We don't know. We, I cannot quantify. But the Mokan tribe also got integrated into the mainstream Thai society. They have now become enfranchised Thai citizens. Uh, so you have this kind of, uh, well, uh, shall to include policy framework, we have legislation in place. We have the enforcement uh, infrastructure that is the, shall we say the bureaucracy, we also have participation of NGOs and um, all this are there. We have the policy framework. What's missing is, um, shall we say, enforcement because there is corruption in the enforcement. Uh, is there a significant role for community volunteers, NGOs, etc. in national policy framework on BioShield? Well, bio, yes, there, there is always scope for volunteering. Uh, if you want, you can go and become a part of the volunteer network. You can plant mangrove ecosystem in a fishbone pattern. You can, um, it's essential. I have, I'll show you some images of how Pichavaram, where they have planted it in a fishbone pattern. See, you will see, uh, let me go directly. You will see, see, these are all, these are planted mangroves, which have been planted in the fishbone pattern of which apparently helps the intertidal ecosystem uh, sustain or thrive. All this you can see. The intertidal, these are all, all these are canals where the water comes in and goes out once every, it flushes, the intertidal ecosystem flushes the mangrove this, uh, ecosystem if it is planted in a, a fishbone pattern. That is what the researchers say. It's not mine. That's what they say. Ah. See, all these are fishbone patterns planting of mangroves and so you can volunteer see all these are new newly planted ecosystem newly planted mangroves the un is also propagating it all these are fishbone patterns the un is propagating it and these in fact there was one picture which is won an award by the un photo library itself one picture taken by the UN photo library. It is there. I have shown it on many occasions. I can show it again sometime. Uh, so those places, uh, if you plant it in, there is a need for volunteers to plant, to take up planting or propagating uh, this kind of fishbone pattern of plantation of mangrove ecosystem. So there is scope for volunteering. Any constructive activity needs a lot of support and volunteering by NGOs, volunteers, etc. If you can propagate, even you can sit at home and propagate it on social media. Just that much. Um, is that over? Now, in earlier episodes, you had mentioned that the Andaman Islands was spared the onslaught of the Asian tsunami compared to the Nicobar Islands. The Nicobar Islands subsided into the ocean and they were never nearer to the epicenter of the Andaman earthquake. The Nicobar Islands do not have mangroves. All these seem like multiple factors, which is the most accurate explanation. Very interesting. Yes, uh, in Nicobar Islands, because of the development, uh, 
the human centric development the the mangroves have been destroyed which is perhaps one of the factors why dicobards suffered so much in uh, the asian tsunami also the topography you know the car nicobar for example you want me to show it i'll just show it to you car nicobar is a flat piece of land we we'll jump across the bay of bengal now see these are the from here this is car nicobar to this point is all nicobar islands uh car nicobar is a flat tamalu this is a flat piece of quadrangular uh, island so there was nothing to hold the the tsunami waves from coming to the middle of the island the maximum human casualties and mortalities in the asian tsunami in the nicobar island was in car nicobar island um, i think more than 1200 people died whereas here in which is the, the this is the southernmost island which is uh, great nicobar island or campbell bay this is nearest to the this is nearest to the uh, epicenter or to indonesia here it's a well, the fault line as you can see here the fault line runs right across uh, campbell bay here you can see since the fault line rise runs right through campbell bay it's a very hilly terrain so the people were whoever there was only 31 people who died in Khan, in the great nicobar island and even the livestock went into the hills and so did the human beings they ran into the hills and this this is the only area where there are hills so it really depends on uh, the topography of the place and remember in andaman islands which is separated by this uh, great channel 10 degrees channel as it's called by the time the tsunami waves came to andaman islands as separated from the nicobar islands by the so called uh, 10 degrees channel the the wave the power of the waves had obviously been mitigated to some extent because of sheer distance and then and one more thing is um, one more thing is uh, in the andaman islands well by the time the tsunami waves came to andaman islands it had uh, slowed down the impact had slowed down and if by one more thing is yes in andaman islands some some most of the the uh, mangroves are intact this is because a lot of indigenous people live there in the great andamanese the ongays then there are the jaravas the, uh, they they are there and uh, they they do stills fishing or harpoon fishing they don't do fishing by boats for example and uh, they have retained the mangroves mangroves are retained because the development hasn't gone there i mean human development hasn't touched andaman as much as it has touched nicobar so that's another factor and yes mangroves have played a factor i think mr mr rana matthew was quoted in the chapter as saying yes the presence of mangroves in the andaman district or the andaman islands were significant in mitigating the power of the tsunami waves as compared to the nicobar islands so yes though these are all factors i agree ha huh. and yes nicobar islands were clear, closer to the uh, epicenter of the earthquake so they subsided more Uh, whereas the andaman islands because they have been separated by the 10 degrees channel it heaved up whereas the and uh, nicobar islands he subsided so these are all factors these are all geographical factors that accounted for the power of the tsunami being stronger in nicobar than in andaman i hope that answers your question how can bio shield sequester carbon and mitigate climate change very very interesting question how it can sequester carbon is because of they have aerial prop roots their roots don't go underground they come above the ground you would have seen it in many a place in the pictures so they, they that helps in um, sequestering carbon and in regulating the intertidal flushing of the intertidal ecosystem so to say every 6 hours the sea water comes in and goes out so it maintains the uh, the system soil substrata and the soil nutrition very effectively and it sequesters carbon the, by sequestering carbon obviously you have you are mitigating climate change or you are slowing down so that it, it's a very very critical role that the mangroves play Uh, how can we not ah, i hope that answers your question you mentioned the role of mangroves in great deal with respect to tamil nadu and anl islands are there enough mangroves in lakshadweep especially minikoy island now uh, yes this is also a very interesting question and uh, lakshadweep also suffers from the impact of uh, 
cyclones come 29th of november every year the cyclone a northeast monsoon cyclone ha hammers lakshadweep if there are the if the health of the ecosystem mangrove ecosystem are good there then or it can mitigate it otherwise yes they will pay the price recently i think it was in 2018 or 19 there was uh, cyclone lucky or cyclone something which i think it was in 2018 or 17 i'm not sure uh, it pummeled lakshadweep because the early warning had not been sounded off early enough so as simple as that uh, but yes if the, and in i'll show you where nicobar is in a minute let me just take you there This is Andaman Nicobar Islands here. You are right about that. Uh, in Lakshadweep, uh, these are the Lakshadweep Islands. Uh, the, it's a t sensitive coral ecosystem, but there again you will see a lot of coconut. That's where coconut plantations, which have obviously destroyed mangrove ecosystem. But here you will see, let's see. These are all coconuts. You don't see much of the jungle or the mangrove forest ecosystem per se. But then you have a lot of sand dunes, you have coral reef ecosystem. These are the natural frontiers for Lakshadweep. Uh, those can also be very effective in mitigating cyclones or its impact. <coughs> but then, yeah, any island ecosystem is very vulnerable to hydrometeorological disasters like storms, sea surges, cyclones, etc. All of these islands, Kadmat, Bitra, Ch Chetlat, uh, Kiltan, Bangaram, Agati, Karavati, Androt, uh, and especially Minikoi, like you mentioned, is the farthest. I think this is Minikoi. This is, I think this is, yes. I think this is Minikoi Island. Uh, you can see again, it's and it's, by the way, a very, very rich island because most of every family in Minikoi has a merchant navy staffer employed in the merchant navy or rather a family member employed in the merchant navy it's a very very rich and uh, shall we say affluent uh, community of, of islanders uh, they, but their development is not like you know they don't bother insist on uh, i have not been to many i must say uh, they don't insist on ultra luxury things like malls etc uh, you know fla uh, flat screen tv led tvs or whatever that is the norm in andaman nicobar islands but not so much in uh, lakshadweep at least to my knowledge uh, so you don't have that kind of consumption which is unsustainable so uh, they are by and large sustain self sustaining and they can uh, but i don't know about the ecosystem you can see a lot of coconut plantations whether there are mangroves there i'm not too sure even if there are no mangroves there are a lot of you know these kind of uh, reef ecosystem which is essential in the maldives too you don't have so much of mangroves to my knowledge though i've been to maldives i uh, do not know much in the sense in, i have not traveled very far and wide in maldives but apart from uh, mangroves in lakshadweep the coral reef ecosystem is the uh, bio shield in itself i hope that answers your question any more questions you mentioned the role of okay we finished that uh, minikoi from what i know is a very affluent and very well developed area they're also very self-sustaining but they don't have things like malls and you know high class international highways and that kind of thing is not there there it's an island ecosystem and their needs are entirely different they don't need high speed highways for example uh, that kind of thing is not necessary so i hope that has uh, any more questions have i missed out anything please shed light on the role of indigenous people in bio shield management aha yes uh, let's go back to the andamans uh, see because uh, because of the presence of indigenous people like jaravas onges sent not so much sentinelese we don't know anything about the sentinelese there are the great andamanese the onges and um, the jaravas uh, in uh, andaman islands and uh, since they are not integrated into mainstream society and they don't have contact with the mainstream land lovers like us uh, we have not had much contact with them so uh, and that is why development has not gone to them on a per capita basis let's say that is why perhaps their natural ecosystems and they are content with the kind of natural ecosystem they have they are, there was this very uh, 
polemical issue about you know their human development index not being in comparison to land dabbers and mainstreamers that they don't even wear clothes you don't need to wear clothes in such a hot and humid place they don't need to wear clothes excuse me uh, they are happy being what they are so uh, that kind of that is the question which is why uh, there is not so much you know development in terms and uh, uh, anthropologists will not allow you to build a huge, a huge highway ecosystem otherwise the government would have a field day by constructing highways etc you don't need that in uh, this kind of uh, uh, indigenous territory so to say okay that having been said about the andamans that's one issue and then you will see how the the mangroves have benefited the irulas in pichavaram uh, essentially, the story is like this about the Irulas. The Irulas were snake hunters and uh, hunter-gatherer tribe. They were they used to hunt snakes and uh, rats and subsist on eating them. And that they used to consume the meat of snakes and rats. But obviously, it came to a pass. It came to such a st uh, standstill or to such a situation that by 2004, they did not have food security. What happened was uh, when the uh, the tsunami happened and uh, they it was discovered that they were not even uh, they were on the brink of extinction because they didn't have enough food security. Uh, then the administration included them in something called the scheduled tribe list. Once they were included, they were able to avail of benefits and schemes that uh, stipulated. Uh, legislated by the government of India and government of Tamil Nadu. They became part of the mainstream society. They were able to get benefits in terms of government schemes, including food security. So, and they were realized that without livelihood security, they cannot depend on food security, food handouts. Uh, in the immediate aftermath of the tsunami, okay, they were given food doles, but they, they cannot sustain on food doles forever. So, they, uh, they, there was a World Bank, uh, grant or of aid given to uh, non-governmental organizations including ms swaminathan research foundation which utilized this funding for training the irulas in fishing they were given uh, skills in fishing crab trapping uh, then in um, in uh, they were taught how to plant uh, mangrove plants in a fishbone pattern and then in the meanwhile 2006 uh, uh, the forest rights act of india was passed and they were uh, so then mangrove ecosystem became a forest division and it became sacrosanct and it became you were not it had to be inviolate uh, but then the ms swaminathan research foundation lobbied on behalf of the irulas and got them fishing rights in lieu of protection of the mangrove forests then uh, it became a win-win solution they were able to not just uh, protect the mangrove forest in tandem with the forest department during patrolling but they also planted the mangrove saplings in a fishbone pattern which augmented uh, the intertidal ecosystem and helped nourish uh, the it became a sanctuary literally for fishers fishes varieties of fish and uh, of faunal diversity so then the uh, the forest department was very happy that the mangrove ecosystem is thriving and the fishers were very happy that they were getting a better fish catch. They could sell their fish catch. They got livelihood training in fish, fishing they, and they got boats and craft and ore, etc. So they were able to harness and harvest or maximize their benefits by doing a sustainable job of fisheries. And they got livelihood security and food security also.